I, I speak to you not as a person who comes from uh, the political sector or, or the media, but as a businessman. Uh, my career, as you know, was in private equity, uh, where I was involved in, in doing pretty risky things. Uh, and I suppose when I started to think about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, which was important to me not only because of my attachment uh, to Israel, but also because I was born in Egypt. I lived in Egypt until the age of 11. Uh, I had to leave Egypt as a refugee uh, to go to Britain. And I left with a sympathy for the Arab world, because actually until the advent of, of NASA, uh, relations between Jews and, uh, and Egyptians had been quite remarkable over a period of a century. And I started to analyze uh, the situation. I came to the conclusion that, you know, peace does not seem easy to attain uh, because so many different factors are involved. But if you begin to dissemble the factors, as we had to do in Britain uh, in the case of Northern Ireland, you begin to realize that actually there are three uh, fundamental elements to it. Uh, and that you need to work on these three elements, and you don't wait for peace to arrive, you have to search for peace. And searching for peace isn't just a question of political negotiation between two leaders, it requires a process. And I started uh, my work at the Portland Trust seven years ago, we had an office in London uh, initially, uh, then uh, a couple of years later, we opened an office in Tel Aviv, which is run by uh, ex-Brigadier General Eval Giladi, uh, who was head of strategy for the army. And uh, a year after that, we opened an office in Ramallah. So it's been open for three, four years now, run by Sameh Halile, who was in the private sector, and uh, then was a secretary to the cabinet of Prime Minister Abu Allah. And the more... Uh, people came into my office in London when we set up, and uh, the head of the Foreign Office was one of these uh, people, the more he'd say to me, you know, we're very concerned about uh, the Palestinian economy. There doesn't seem to be anything there to provide hope or employment. And I said, you know, I'd like to have a look at the Palestinian economy. Uh, as an Apex Partners leader, I want to have a look at it as a private equity uh, investor would look at it. And we analyzed it. We had a team of 10 people looking at it. And we came to the conclusion, you know what? This is a highly industrious people, 97% literacy, the same as, as the Lebanon. Egypt, where I was born, has 57% literacy. It has five sectors to its economy, both traditional manufacturing sectors like clothes and, uh, and, and shoes and uh, stuff like that. Uh, but also stone cutting and uh, construction, agriculture and agri products. Uh, it's got tourism. Uh, it's got an IT sector, a budding IT sector. It's got an energy sector. And what struck me was this economy could be four or five times the size that it is. You compare the population of, uh, of uh, Palestine uh, with the population of the Lebanon, it's the same population. Compare the GNP, taking aid out, 4 billion for 4 million people in Palestine, and in the Lebanon, 29 billion for 4 million people. And we began to look within Northern Ireland at the relationship between economics and violence. And if I could show you the chart uh, today, over a 30-year period, you would see that attacks by Catholics in Northern Ireland rose and fell with the level of unemployment. And the level of unemployment in 1970 was 17 or 18 percent, and in 2000 was 6 percent. And the graph is unbelievable. The relationship between uh, uh, Catholic unemployment relative to Protestant unemployment and attacks by Catholics in the North is total. And so we began to look in depth at the economic track on the basis that if people have no future, if they have nothing to protect, if extremists are giving them the best option for trying to make progress for themselves, the chances of a reasonable compromise must be very slim. And we began to work with Palestinians, Palestinian businessmen, the private sector, to try to develop 
plans that would enable them to strengthen the Palestinian private sector so that it can provide employment and growth to its citizens. Today, unemployment in the West Bank is around 17, 18 percent. In 2004, it was about 25 percent. In Gaza today, unemployment is 40 percent. Employment by the government in Gaza seems to be around 50 percent of the population. In the West Bank, employment by the government is only 17 percent. Does this not begin to give you a sense of the importance of, of, of the private sector, the importance of giving people control over their own destiny? They don't want to be controlled by Israel, but nor do they want to be controlled by a government that controls every one of their economic activities. And I must say that as I listen to the skepticism around um, the table, I don't uh, participate in it. Obviously, it's very difficult, and obviously nobody can predict when peace will be achieved. But one thing that I'm convinced of is that if we can allow Palestinians to develop their economy at a rate of 10% a year for 10 years, it'll make a massive difference to the acceptability of, of the peace process and the compromise that can be reached. And up until Salam Fayyad, the argument that I heard most frequently from Palestinians was normalization is wrong. We cannot accept an improvement in our standard of living because it will reduce our chances of getting a fair deal for the refugees. We have to perpetuate low standards of living because that's what Israel has imposed on us and that's what got, got to be set right. What has Prime Minister Fayyad done in contrast to that? He's held investment conferences where he said, I'm open for business, come and invest. He's published the two-year plan, which just came out, which is called Establishing the Basis for the State. He is saying, I saw him a couple of days ago in, uh, in Ramallah, he is saying, I want to do what the Jewish agency did. I want to control the reality of the state before the declaration of the existence of the state. And is that not a significant change is this attitude and the support of uh, uh, President Abu Mazen, is that not a change from what we've known previously, uh, viewed from this side with, uh, with uh, Arafat, with Yasser Arafat? It's a huge change. And I think, therefore, that in order to find peace, you've got to look for it. You've got to put yourself in a position where you get the economic track going, you get the security track going, which it is now, and you get the political track going. If you have only one or two of these, it's insufficient. Without the hope for a political settlement, it's virtually impossible for any Palestinian political leader to maintain support among his, his population, is my assessment. And so far as process is concerned, <coughs> the fact that Mitchell has been appointed is, in my view, a very significant factor. Uh, we spoke, as Martin uh, very well uh, knows, we spoke with Mitchell long before he was appointed. And it occurred to us that his experience of Northern Ireland, which is not the same type of, of conflict, was highly relevant to what needs to be done here. So let us push on the economic track. Let us allow Palestinians and let us help them to push on the security track. And let's rely on the process that uh, President Obama has put in place with, with Mitchell. And if there is a desire to get to peace, because both sides feel that 20 years from now the situation will be infinitely worse, we'll get there before 20 years' time.